You guys, you guys excited? Oh, yeah. yeah, all right, awesome, okay. I want to start with the story that we all know, and if you took this last year, you're going to know the answer to this, but, um, but try not to give it away. Okay, this is from Matthew's Gospel, okay? Now, I'm going to be using a translation. We all have, there's a, the, uh, the church, in the church, there's, there's so many different translations of the Bible, okay? There's a lot of translations of the Bible out there. Um, I'm using the New Revised Standard Version. The, the bishops have been they're, they're going to give a thumbs up with it. We don't use the New Revised Standard Version in Mass. We use the New American Bible. Well, something you want to keep in mind with the Bible is that uh, it was not originally written in English. Uh, good thing to know, but it's uh, um, the first, most of the Old Testament, though not all of it, was originally composed in Hebrew, some of it in Aramaic, some of it in Greek, but primarily in Hebrew. All of the New Testament was originally composed in Greek. There are some people who feel that Matthew's Gospel was originally composed in Hebrew, but modern scholarship has kind of gone in a different direction and said it, the evidence seems to point to Greek as being the original language. And here we go. Six days later, Jesus, this is from Matthew chapter 17. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his, uh, and uh, his brother John, and led them up, by a high, up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. When he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. If you took this before, don't answer it. This is one of the most famous passages in all of Scripture. You've all heard it at some time or another. Jesus up on a mountain, Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, and they're up on this mountain, and suddenly Jesus is transfigured before him. It means that he has made this dazzling, white, luminous figure, and suddenly to his left and to his right are Moses and Elijah. My question to you, why Moses? Why Elijah? What's the significance? They were the only two that were like ascended into him, like with their bodies? No, um, Elijah, yes. Moses, no. The only two people who ever ascended totally into heaven were uh, Enoch in Genesis and Elijah. That's a good one. That's actually really, I like that. Was it uh, to bring the two together, the Old Testament, with Moses bringing the law and Elijah bringing that's, that is it. That is 100% it, yes. Here is why Jesus appears to, uh, with Moses and Elijah. This is a highly symbolic action. This is very important to understand you know, what Jesus is all about. To Jesus' one side is Moses. And as we all know, and as we will explore in the, you know, in the coming weeks, is Moses is the representative of the law. God gave the law to Moses through the Torah. Moses figures heavily into all of Jesus' actions and his, his uh, uh, interactions with people. Uh, when, you know, who are Jesus' big, you know, biggest adversaries sometimes? Not all of them, but sometimes. The Pharisees, right? The teachers of the law. And here's Jesus who, if you think about it, when you go to the Sermon on the Mount, what is the first thing Jesus does in Matthew's gospel in the Sermon on the Mount? First, he's on a mountain, which is like the same as Moses going up on Sinai. You have Jesus sitting down, which is a symbolic action of teaching. And you have Jesus completing the law. So when Jesus says something like this, he says, 
you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you this, if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Jesus takes the law and takes it a step further. Jesus is the completion of the law. But you can't appreciate it if you do not know what the law is. And if you don't know what the Christian relationship is to that law. We know the Ten Commandments. We don't know the 613 commandments of the Torah. 613, I mean, that's how many laws there are in the Torah. Do they all apply to Christians? No, they, they don't. And we'll see that as we go on. And Paul makes a big deal about that. We learned that from St. Paul, the difference between the law and grace, which in the New Testament class we'll deal a lot with. But why Elijah? Elijah is a figure that we all, and we will look at, but we, we should all have a good relationship with. We should know who Elijah is. Why? Why should we know who Elijah is? Elijah is the archetype, the template of the prophets. He is the great prophet. He's not the first prophet, but in the book of 1 Kings and a little bit of 2 Kings, we encounter this great prophet who is not just a prophet, but a wonder worker. He works miracles. In fact, the last public miracle that God's people Israel had seen collectively was under Elijah. It was Elijah versus the prophets, or priests, not prophets, the priests of Baal, the, you know, the Canaanite god. And there is this wonderful scene in 1 Kings when, uh, when God, uh, Elijah challenges uh, hundreds of prophets of Baal and says, I'll say Baal or Baal, it's B-A-A-L. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a god we don't believe in. Um, but we, uh, but he, um, he challenges them and, this great, and he does this great, we'll look at it, it's kind of like a showdown. It's almost like watching like an old western. You know? and, uh, and, and Elijah saves the day. Uh, and calls upon God to, to, uh, to consume this sacrifice uh, for fire from the sky and shames the prophets of Baal. It is the last, single last public miracle that the people of God will see. Are there little miracles here and there? Yes, but you don't see this great thing in front of everybody. In fact, in the history of Israel, when is the, last, the next time you see, uh, you see a big public miracle is, well, Jesus. You have to understand that there is a space of some 700 years before, between Elijah and Jesus Christ. So when God's, I mean, imagine that. Imagine that the last public manifestation of God's you know, uh, glory and everything happened set like 700 some odd years ago. What would you think about miracles? What would you think about God? What would you think about what God can, capably, can do in this world? In a world where we don't really believe in miracles, you know, not us necessarily, but collectively. It's not, this is not the age of miracles. It's an age of, of reason and, and science and, and everything else. That miracles don't happen. 700 years ago, yeah, they probably felt like that because they were crazy and whatever. Imagine that same space between Elijah and Jesus. Imagine what it would be like when you see Jesus heal somebody, raise the dead, cure the blind. That is a public miracle. Jesus is a completion of Elijah's work as both prophet and wonder worker. There are even pro uh, miracles that Elijah does that Jesus takes to the stratosphere. But the thing is, for us, for us as Catholics, how is the story of Jesus going to make sense if we don't have the context? How is the story of Jesus going to make sense if we don't have the context. 